Hello, and welcome to this episode of The Security Angle. I'm your host, Shelley Kramer, Managing Director and Principal Analyst here at the Cube Research. And I am joined today by my frequent co-host, fellow analyst, brilliant engineer, member of the Cube Collective Community of Independent Analysts, Joe Peterson. Hi, Joe, great to see you. Hello, Shelley, great to see you too. So today we are going to have a conversation about the cybersecurity risks that are posed by enterprise collaboration tools that I would guess most of you are using on a fairly regular basis and how to combat them. And we are joined today by another brilliant person, Tyler Cohenwood. Tyler's the CEO and the co-founder of a company called Dark Kryptonite. She is an innovative, extremely smart cybersecurity expert. And, um, and one of the things I love about Dark Kryptonite, and Tyler's going to share more about that later, is that um, the, this is a cybersecurity company that offers an off-the-grid, closed-loop network and AI-driven secure browser. So that is really a huge connection to our conversation here. And um, so more about Tyler. Before we dive into this conversation, Tyler has over two decades of expertise in cybersecurity. She's had significant roles, not the least of which is serving as the deputy chief of the Special Communications Office at the Defense Intelligence Agency under the DOD. Um, hello. Some kind of chops are involved there, right? <laughs> and uh, Tyler recently launched the Health Exposed podcast on the ITSP Magazine Network, and that's a platform really where where healthcare and the patient experience meet technology. Um, what I love about that is that with healthcare being so squarely in the crosshairs of today's cyber threat actors, this podcast for me has quickly risen to the top of my weekly must listen list. So we'll let Tyler explain a little bit more about that. Um, here in a moment. Tyler, welcome. It's great to have you. It's so great to be here with you guys. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. And we finally made it happen. We've been talking about this forever. So I'm <laughs> so happy. And I'm so happy that actually Joe proposed this topic and she's fantastic at that. And, mm -hmm. and you know, the thing about collaboration tools is that this happens to be one of my coverage areas here at the Cube Research, but collaboration tools, we all use them. But the reality of it is I'm not sure many of us think much about the risks that they pose to business from a cybersecurity standpoint. I'm thinking probably not. Um, collaboration tools have been a game changer for us. They've revolutionized the way that we work, whether in office or working remotely in the field or in a hybrid situation. And we use these platforms for everything, meetings, chat, whiteboarding, video recording, and, and so much more. Um, but with great convenience, also comes great risk. And that's part of what we're going to talk about today. Um, these very same platforms that we rely on every day mm -hmm. can often be a gateway to sensitive company information, and they can be a tasty target for cyber criminals. So, um, and, and the other factor that's really important here is that while many of the collaboration platforms that we use daily have robust security built in at a foundational level, there's always the human element and user behavior always presents a risk. And so, I think this is a conversation that your your our audience is going to find extremely beneficial. Um, you know, one other thing that I think is is an important element here is that in most situations, in most organizations of all sizes, employees are bouncing in and out of these apps and platforms throughout the day. Um, uh, one estimate that I saw was that on average, an employee juggles eight different types of collaboration tools on a regular basis, of course, depending on their job, their role. I will tell you this, today alone, I've been in my office since about 7.30 this morning. I have used Google Meet, Zoom, WebEx, Microsoft Teams, Slack, Dropbox, <laughs> Box, Google Documents, and StreamYard. <laughs> Okay. And it's three o'clock. I've got hours left to go before I sleep. And so my, and, and so if you're hearing this, you know, think about it, your project management tools, your email, and a lot of times email these days is often built into collaboration platforms. Um, we've got shared calendars. We've got IM tools. We've got cloud sharing, file sharing, video conferencing, whiteboarding, uh, you know, all kinds of enterprise collaboration networks. And then of course, just the collaboration platforms that we use every day. They're, they're, they're in our DNA these days. They're an integral part of how we get work done, but it does bring risks. 
Um, and that's really what we're going to focus on today. Tyler, what I would love to have you share a little bit more about is talk, you know, I kind of talked a little bit about your background, but share with us, if you would, sort of your career backstory um, and, you know, kind of how you got from there to here. And um, that'll kick us off. Okay, great. Um, you know, really one of my, my main goals is that I want to leave the world a safer and better place than it was when I was here. Um, I am very passionate about helping people, organizations, families learn to protect themselves via technology and training. Um, I used to do digital forensics for the Department of Defense Cybercrime Center, and I did a lot of intrusion cases but I also did a lot of major crimes cases and I've seen the worst of the worst. And that's why this is something that is so important to me. Right. Um, you know, I've been in different facets of cybersecurity throughout my career, which started in uh, 1999. I know I just <laughs> aged myself. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I started, I did forensics, I did incident response for the DOD um, and then I moved to the. And hold on, let me interrupt you long enough to say, Tyler, those were very different times. Oh yes, you know what I'm saying, and that, and I think that bears highlighting mm -hmm. because what, how we were using the web in 1998, the early 2000s, has transformed completely, you know, to it where we are today. Awesome. So I think that that's really important to, you know, you had this. Um, you had this responsibility at a at a fairly young age um, it, at a time when things were slightly different. Yeah, they 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 were very different. And um, you know, my college didn't even have a cyber uh, well, it didn't even have a computer science program. Um, <laughs> I was sociology history major, and I was uh, I did a lot of interning for music labels and stuff. But you know, I just found my passion um, doing these investigations, and I helped a lot of people. Um, you know, it was, it was interesting because when I went to DIA, it was, I was doing special comms and special comms is pretty much the opposite of forensics. Um, think about a very high threat mission where you have special forces, you know, going into a high threat country. Well, their devices have to look and feel like their cover story, but For they sure. have to also be able to send information back and forth through off the grid technology or different channels or make make the communication hide in the noise of the other traffic and it's a really out of the box way of thinking but right. You know, I'm kind of a weirdo, so I like thinking like that. <laughs> but, but, you know, the reality of it is sometimes, you know, on, on these career paths of ours, and this is one of the reasons I always ask our guests is kind of start out by sharing their backstories because uh, we learn so many interesting things. But Tyler, that explains everything about dark kryptonite and your passion <laughs> for this. So it, it makes it perfect does. sense. Yeah, yeah it, it really does. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, so I'm also very passionate about healthcare and health tech. Right. Um, in 2018, I got really sick and I didn't know what was going on. And I started going through the healthcare system. And I quickly realized that um, there was something called specialty siloing, where you would go to a doctor with a specific specialty and they would send you to a doctor with a different specialty and kind of wipe their hands of it if they yep. didn't know what it was. So I'm yep. not saying all doctors, but I've, the ones I, yeah. I went to were I've like- I've walked that path. I very much understand. It's really difficult. And I finally realized that if I was going to get anywhere, I had to take my medical case into my own hands and I treated it like a digital forensic exam. And I ended up diagnosing myself with one of the conditions that I have. And, you know, it was it was crazy that I had to go to that those levels. I mean, I would read medical journals. I know what words mean that I cannot pronounce yeah. or spell. But, um, you know, it now it's different. Now I have a great team of doctors at Hopkins. It's awesome. Right. But, you know, I still really want to help other patients right. that may not have that ability so that they can get the best patient outcomes and also educating, um, you know, physicians um, on different methodologies and how to really work with patients. You know, that's mm -hmm. a, always going to be a big passion of mine. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I have walked this walk with one of my daughters who was diagnosed with 
ultimately diagnosed with fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue at the ripe old age of 21. Oh. And, uh, but the journey that we were on was exactly as you described the specialty yeah. silo. And the problem with that is, you know, you find a doctor, you wait, you know, 90 days or six months to get in. You have all your hopes on being able, pinned on being able to finally find a solution to this mm -hmm. horrible problem that you have. And, you know, the doctor thinks they know what it is and they do tests and you go away and you're so hopeful and, oh my God. And then, you know, and then you go in for your follow-up visit, which isn't booked until eight weeks later. And then they tell you at that point in time, yeah, it wasn't what we thought. Sorry, we can't help you. And you, but you've wasted yep. all this time. So I love your passion for that. And as I said, you know, I wouldn't wish a journey like that on anyone. Um, it no, is definitely. horribly difficult to a path to walk, but um, I, I do think that uh, it perfectly explains your healthcare passion. I get it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna dive in here. I walked us through a little bit of the backstory on the rise in collaboration platforms. And of course, you know, in, in some ways, you know, we're such interesting creatures, you know, we don't spend a lot of time thinking about our evolution, you know, our journey, how we got from here to there. And of course, a global pandemic spurred the embrace of and use of collaboration platforms kind of like nothing before. Right. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, once upon a time, email was our go to channel. That's changing. It's funny. People still tell me all the time that email is dead or dying or whatever, but email is here and it's going to stay certainly for the near term. But um, but that's changing and we don't only rely on email. And, you know, I laugh when I think about, you know, if I'm having a conversation with Joe and we're talking about something, did I share that with her by email, by text message? Did I share it in Dropbox? <laughs> did I share it as a private message on it's You know, and you're trying to, you right? You see things on Instagram too, so there's that. Yeah, and so we're, but, but, but that's, all of our lives. We're yeah. all bouncing from channel to channel. Or, you know, when you're on a Zoom call with somebody, but you and your colleague are back channeling in Slack or on uh, instant message or whatever. So anyway, but, you know, we're, we're all using these platforms and, you know, with, with great things, and these are great things. I'm not going to lie. I think they're wonderful, but there's, they come, the risk is associated with that. So, so we wanted to talk with, about how big of a risk organizations face with the various enterprise comms and collaboration tools. And, you know, I say enterprise, but this really spans across all companies yeah. of all sizes. And, you know, and some of these risks that, some of these risks are obvious, but mm. some of them, you know, data breaches, right? You've got an increased number of potential entry points in a wider attack surface. Yep. You've got the sharing of sensitive information, whether it's PII or PHI or PCI data or credentials. Um, phishing is omnipresent. You've got insider threats, you know, people inside your organization that yep. may do nefarious things. You've got access management, you've got insecure APIs, you've got misconfigurations, which are always a problem. And, and you know, another thing that I think presents a risk that people don't think about often, certainly often enough, is improper lifecycle management. And that's really keeping documents for too long or disposing of documents that might be important later. And then there's an accidental release of information that is a risk. And I'm sure there's some other ones, but this is just kind of some highlights. And you know, one thing I'll say before I hand it over to you, Joe, is that, you know, as you know, I left an organization that I founded about a year ago. And one of our primary ways of communicating that had evolved over the course of the last five years or so was we used WebEx for all of our internal comms. And mm -hmm. It was not at all uncommon. And, and I will say this, I tend to use my email as sort of my file cabinet and I keep important documents in, in specific files in my email. I could go back and find something from 10 years ago that I filed in my email. I'm very organized about that. And that may be one of the few things I am organized about. Um, but what we saw happening in a very fairly quick way was people on our team, including senior leadership, would share important documents, contracts, proposals, scopes of work, internal documents. And instead of sharing them in email, they were shared through the WebEx platform. And um, when I stopped and thought about, first of all, um, 
you know, what the, the reality, the danger of that and having that kind of place be your repository for important information is when I lost, when I left that company, I lost access to any document that had been shared there. So that can be problematic. Um, yeah. But the other thing is that, you know, when, I mean, we had personnel information, HR information, all yeah. kinds of mm -hmm. private information about, you know, we would keep a file with employee dates of birth and addresses and everything it was convenient. It was all in one place. It was easy yep. to find. And so, so that really sets the stage here for what I know you're going to dive into, Joe, is, you know, really some of these risks we don't think about, but they could be some pretty big risks. Oh, yeah. oh, totally. And I don't know if you ladies caught it or not. I was just sitting there watching, I don't know, one of the news channels the other day at lunch. And about fell off my chair because, because there was a commercial about WhatsApp being end-to-end -end encrypted. And I thought, hold up, somebody Whoa. is using, right, somebody is using end-to-end -end encryption as a differentiator, as a differentiator in their messaging platform. I thought <laughs> it was brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, thought, it was, I thought it was brilliant. Um, I was like. And oh, you know what? Okay. I will tell you this, Joe. I have some enterprise clients, gigantic multi million dollar companies who do all of their communicating on WhatsApp. That's interesting. Yeah. That a lot of people, so, a lot of people do. I mean, but you, know so, but you know what else? But you know what else? It's the discoverability. It, mm. Yeah, it is. Because even though it's mm -hmm. encrypted, it can still be seen that there's a communication happening. Correct. Well, but sometimes organizations uh, are making decisions that they think will protect them mm -hmm. in the case of litigation. Mm -hmm. yes. So when I say discoverability, mm -hmm. I'm talking about uh, email. It's not email. Yeah, it's not in your corporate collaboration platform. Yeah. It's over here. Yep, and they have to know to go find it. You're right. Discoverability yep. from a legal standpoint. Yeah, that's yeah. a no. that's a really good point. Yeah, it is a good mind point. blown. <laughs> yeah, right. I know, right? <laughs> well, we know, ladies. We know that the law takes a while to to catch yeah. up with technology. Right? Yes, it does. It does. So it just does. So let me get back on topic here. I just straight <laughs> off into the ground. Um, I, I think that was my fault. So I, I apologies. I don't know. Uh, we're, we're chatty. We're just chatty. Um, so, so Tyler, I know that Shelly mentioned earlier that while some organizations have made great strides in email security, which they have and it's key, uh, phishing remains a primary and super successful tactic. Yep. It's utilized by threat actors. We all know that's sitting here. So if you think about it, how secure do you think email is in comparison to the other collaboration channels we have going on? Well, I mean, the, the email is only going to be as secure as the security measures taken and the mm -hmm. users who are using it. And I would say that for the other collaboration platforms as well. I mean, sure. You know, these platforms have significantly increased and continue to and, and it continues to escalate, you know, daily. We get more and more and more tools. And in all honesty, if this was 2016, I would probably say that cybersecurity awareness training was sufficient. But that's no longer the case. We still mm -hmm. need cybersecurity awareness training as a first level of defense. But we also need more tools, frameworks, and technology that really help enhance that security posture. Because, you know, you could have the most secure collaboration tool that's secure today, but that doesn't mean that you can just leave it. Because cybersecurity is a living, breathing thing, right. and it has to be updated regularly to keep up with the new vulnerabilities. And then take into account that threat actors have actually become a lot more sophisticated in their attack methods you know, with the increase of newer technology, increased third party responsibilities and advancements of AI and better social engineering tactics. You know, we're really more at risk than we ever have before. And yeah. 
I know that it only takes one vulnerability for a threat actor to breach a system, while organizations have to understand and manage all the risks and vulnerabilities, but they also have to maintain functionality, which is going to inherently involve some kind of risk. And I think about it like a car. If you take the wheels, the engine, tires, or seats off of the car, out of the car, it's probably not going to get stolen, but you can't use it either. So striking a balance between security and usability is a really difficult task to do, but it's crucial. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But, you know, I feel like, and tell me what you think, I feel like email's on everybody's radar, right? It's not yeah. just the, the IT people anymore. The executives know, oh, wow, you know, we got to make sure our emails, it's been bubbled up enough that they've, mm -hmm. you know, smelled the coffee and said, oh, okay, well, we've got a secure email. So we probably are doing okay job securing email, but I never hear about anything securing these other channels. Um, I, I don't either. Right? Do you, so my question is, do you think that organizations are taking that risk category as a serious one? Um, you know, I think that most organizations realize the security risk, but I don't know if they always know what to do about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I do a lot of keynotes and I'm, I interact with a lot of CISOs and, you know, they, they say to me a couple of things. They say, there's way too much information to keep up with and too many tools and they suffer from tool fatigue and they, they, they really, there's like a sense of kind of depression around them. And, you know, I think about it like this too. I saw a study recently where a large company pulled medium to large um, organizations on their security posture. 76% of those people, of those companies came back and said they expect to be hacked within the next 12 months. Yeah. That is insane. If I were looking on Yelp to go to a restaurant and 76% of people said it was no good, I would never go. So, you know, I don't, we, we just have to be doing a lot better. And, you know, that's, that was a very scary statistic to see. But what it really comes down to is this. If you have a domain name, which everyone does, everybody, the hackers know where you live. And you can't very easily change your domain. Um, and hackers know that. Also, the internet was not designed to be secure. Mm -hmm. And we've been trying to put a Band-Aid on a gaping wound that is just not working. And it's never going to be secure as we need it to be. So that's where alternatives have to come into play. And not all information or collaborations need to be secure to like the and degree, but some right. of them actually do. Right. So, you know, last question, we kind of talked about encryption on a standalone app a minute ago. Um, but if I'm, I'm thinking about locking some of this other stuff down, would, would things like MFA help? Um, and, and how do I go about even getting MFA on, on some of these apps? Well, MFA is, is, is crucial. You, you, you have to have it because it's part of that layered approach and, mm -hmm. you know, getting it to work, you know, with your email client, there are a lot of tools that can help do that. Um, all, you should really be using MFA with everything, not just your work accounts, but okay. you know, your personal accounts too, you know, and, and sometimes I, I know, cause I ask people that are not in cybersecurity, what they think about cybersecurity a lot. And I'm always shocked that they don't think it's like so, as important as I do, but mm -hmm. it's okay. And mm -hmm. when I ask about things like MFA, they say, oh my God, it's so annoying. I have to log mm -hmm. in, then I have to put in this and this and this, yeah. and it just yeah. takes so much longer, but it's a necessity Yeah. and it has to be used. I mean, we need to have as many tools in our cybersecurity uh, toolkit that we can possibly have. Right. Right. Well, you know, and I think, ladies, it's as easy as this. You know, I'm sure that you're both familiar with a common tactic that thieves are embracing these days have to do with these little things that we walk around with all the time. Right. Oh, so yeah. you're walking around at an event or on a city street or whatever. And, you know, you're on your phone. 
right? It's obvious you're on your phone. Mm -hmm. So what is very common is that thieves will come up while you're using your device, grab your device so it's unlocked. They'll run mm -hmm. off. They'll quickly change the settings on your phone so that you can't, they'll change the password. They'll ch So they completely negate your ability to wipe the phone or anything else. It's gone. It's gone. And by the way, your phone is unlocked. Oh, here's Zoom. Wow. Oh, here's Teams. Oh, here's WebEx. So you're opening any one of these apps that we all use all the time, but now they have access to Shelly Kramer. Mm -hmm. That keeps access into all of my shit. That that takes sim swapping to a totally different yeah, level. It does, but this is very, very common and it's happening all over the world. Um, lots of, I've, I've seen lots of stories happening to tourists in Europe and beyond, mm -hmm. but it's happening everywhere. So there are some things you can do, by the way, um, on settings on your phone to uh, try to thwart that. But the, the point that I was trying to make is, you know, okay, extrapolate the same thing about your laptop. You're sitting somewhere like all of us do. You're mm -hmm. at an event, you're at a cafe, you're whatever, you whatever. Maybe you walk away. Maybe you go up to the counter to get a stir. Maybe you do something. I mean, somebody could swipe your laptop. It's unlocked. It's open. And all of a sudden, they've easily got access to every bit of corporate and confidential information that you have. So yeah. this is no small thing, people. Yeah. This is a very big deal. And it's, it goes far beyond, you know, the innocuous things that Joe and I might be chatting about over in WebEx. That is nothing, but it comes back to that corporate information, that sensitive data. This is a gateway to the corporate network. I mean, it, it is. And even scarier than that is many of the things, the IoT devices or helper devices that we use you know, they're controlled by an app on the phone. Right. So mm -hmm. you can be giving people access to your house, to yep. your house. webcam, yeah. your baby monitor. I mean, it's really scary. I mean, that's that's crazy. Right. Well, and the other thing is, is that ordinary average, I mean, we are immersed in this space. We live it, we walk it, we talk it, we dream it, right? So we're kind of freaks about, you know, I mean, I know sometimes people's eyes glaze over when I start talking about the importance of password man endpoint management and, you know, whatever. Um, but the reality of it is we are surrounded in our personal and business lives by things that are connected to the internet, mm -hmm. yes. our routers, our TVs, our refrigerators, our vacuum cleaners, our, you know, uh, uh, our digital assistants, our photo, so many things, you know, in yeah. offices, your lighting, your HVAC systems, your mm -hmm. so many things like that. So, you know, those are all endpoints. And when a threat actor can get access to those endpoints, that's when bad things happen, you know, or, uh, you know, mm -hmm. and, Sometimes they lay around in, in networks for a very long time, just waiting for an opportunity. So, so it, it is interesting times, um, you know, okay. So Joe just asked you Tyler about end to end encryption. you know, obviously that's important, strong administrative controls or things that, you know, we know that people should look for. Um, let's dive deeper, Tyler, and pick that mm -hmm. big dog on brain of yours. What are other things that organizations of all sizes should be thinking about? when we're talking about collaboration platforms within the organization? So um, we've already talked about a couple of them. So end-to-end -end encryption and strong administrative controls are going to be essential for right. securing that digital workplace. Um, MFA is a necessity. Um, data loss pretension, uh, data loss prevention tools uh, definitely to ensure that sensitive data is not lost, misused right. or accessed by unauthorized users, um, regular security audits and compliance checks, um, even user behavior analytics to determine if something is suspicious, um, secure, oh, secure access service edge, SASE, mm -hmm. you know, really integrating this wide area network with comprehensive security services to protect users and applications, regardless of where they are. Um, automation. <clears throat> so automation of threat detection and response. Um, I know everyone's heard about zero trust architecture, but it actually is, is something that is crucial to have. Right. And more important, a really important one that people don't always think about is a comprehensive backups and storage solution because 
if something goes wrong, you need to be able to move to those backups right away. Right. Well, and, you know, to go back to my example, you know, I shared that, and this is true, I'm using WebEx, WebEx as an example because it happened to be the platform that we used in my prior role. But um, from an executive leadership standpoint, yeah. thinking about and regularly auditing the information that is stored in there, that lifecycle management part of the equation, I think is important. Um, and, and just understanding that this is, I, I think that, you know, you made a point just earlier that, you know, our IT teams are playing a daily game of whack-a-mole, right? Yes. And, you mm -hmm. know, and, and with the advent of Gen AI, you know, we've got uh, AI security and we've got security for AI and they're kind of two different things, but they're yeah. equally as important as, as one another. And, and so I think that just understanding from a risk standpoint, a corporate risk standpoint, again, regardless of the size of your organization, right. that collaboration platforms are wonderful. They also present risk yeah. um, and attack vectors that you may not be thinking about. And that's really, I think the whole purpose of this conversation is collaboration tools and platforms are amazing. I understand the amazing things that they deliver also have risks associated with it. And, and you need to be factoring that into your strategies. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So um, as we wrap the show, I mean, I could do the three of us could talk about this forever. I know um, next time we'll have to do it over drinks. Um, so, so Tyler, I know we talked about dark kryptonite earlier. I know that you're one of the founders um, I would love to know more about how this off the grid closed loop network and that, that is combined with an AI driven secure browser. How can this play this kind of solution play a role in protecting organizations and their collaboration platforms? So I started really analyzing the bad guys and the good guys, you know, the threat actors and where we were failing and I realized really quickly that the bad guys are using special comms and we needed to combat that with special comms. And again, you know, I go back to, if you have a presence on the internet, you can be hacked. Um, so I came, came up with this idea where you're going into, you're not using the traditional internet, you're using a different internet that we kind of call the alternate. And what this is, is you're actually not connecting to domains. You're not connecting to IP addresses. You're connecting to hashes. And mm -hmm. because you're connecting to hashes, you can change things on the fly. And I like to think about it like this. So think of the internet as highways and streets. And there's lots of cars that can go on the highways and streets. They have identifying features. They can kind of do whatever they want versus NASCAR, which is a closed loop track, but think of it as a closed loop network. Okay. And the cars from um, the streets and highways, they're not getting into that closed loop network and the cars from that closed loop network are not getting out to the streets and the highways. Right. So it's an alternative um, to the internet, but you're utilizing hashes to connect to. So if you're doing that, you can change those on the fly and they can also be reproduced on the fly. You can save and store files at hashes as well. And you can do email. You can do any of your communication um, technologies through this uh, encrypted, th this network that is very obfuscated and off the grid. Um, is it designed though, Tyler, for internal comms or is this something you can utilize to communicate both. with? Okay. Okay. It, oh. it, it's, it's for both. And, okay. you know, because you're not using domains and because you're not using TCP IP in a traditional manner. Right. One of the really cool things is that um, if you get, you know, a phishing attack, well, a phishing attack, um, especially ransomware, you know, it's trying to escalate its privileges and think of it as like a train, the internet, the train track, and it knows how to go on that train track to escalate its privileges. But right. when you hit start kryptonite, it's just such a different methodology that it doesn't know what to do. And it just stops. It can't escalate. It can't mm -hmm. do anything because it doesn't have those train tracks. And 
you can even create your own like partial domains if you want. Like you can mm -hmm. email, say, Tyler at Dark Crypt Tonight with no dot com or anything like that. And I could be, um, you know, communicating and sending large files, you know, with with Shelly, you know, at Acme with no domain. Oh, wow. And it's also really good for collaboration as well. Um, but one of the other really good things that it, it helps with is there's a lot of legacy systems out there that are compliant with nothing, mm -hmm. but they still need to be used. If you wrap it in this network, it is now in compliance with many, most standards. So it's a different type of internet. It's a different way of doing security and um, it's off the grid. And when I conceptualize these things, I still think of it as I did when I was at DIA, that if the communication is, is captured, that means the person's dead. So you cannot, um, it, it has to be completely obfuscated. Mm -hmm. And when you're throwing AI into the mix, you know, learning the heuristics of the system, it can actually start to change hashes on the fly if it needs to. Mm -hmm. But say you have your organization, you have your finance department, you have HR, um, you can actually limit um, what they're able to access just based on the hash. So HR mm -hmm. may have this hash they connect to. Yeah. Access um, management, you yes, know, sort of, yeah. Mm -hmm. And but, but you're saying that you don't even have to segment the network. That's what I'm heard, hearing you saying. It's network segmentation doesn't matter because they only have access to what they have access to. Right. It, yeah. It, exactly. And um, like I think about you know Hospital A that has to get a lot of information securely to Hospital B, right. and they can do it in this completely off the grid manner. You know, when you also think about uh, people in countries where it's very difficult for them to communicate, this is, you know, an underground channel where they right. can actually do that yeah. and communicate. And stay and, alive. Exactly. <laughs> and the app that will that connects to the Dark Kryptonite network has to be what's called containerized. And how I perceive that is that it means the client does not make any system calls because it uses its own statically linked libraries that are contained mm -hmm. within the program. So it's not making calls or bleeding into other areas. It sounds really incredibly cool. Thank you. Yeah, it is it pretty cool. Yeah, no, I like it a lot. And I am absolutely going to um, have you walk me through a demo because I think this is amazing and I can see tons and tons of use cases. And um, I think it's really impressive. I didn't really know something like this existed. Yeah, I mean, it. it I, I, I kind of think in a weird way. So <laughs> maybe it's because I'm left handed. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's working for you. Well, thank you. It's working for you. Well, all right, ladies, I'm afraid our time has come to an end, but this has been a terrific conversation, Tyler. You are absolutely positively, no buts about it, going to be back on this show and we're going to continue our conversation on this and a variety of other topics. You've been amazing as I knew you would be. And um, Joe, you're always amazing. And and you know that whether uh, I, I should tell you that more often, but you are, you're my amazing friend and I'm grateful for you. Um, you. To our viewing and listening audience, Thank you so much again. I'm Shelly Kramer. You're listening to The Security Angle, um, which is part of, um, part of the Cube Network. And so we will see you here next time. And as always, we thank you for hanging out with us. And ladies, we'll see you next time. Thank Bye. you. Bye.